Coming up with this week in computer hardware, AMD X-Connect means external GPUs for all the laptops. Corsairs get a nice case, new NVIDIA drivers, and a low-power GTX 950, and Presentmon gives the goods. All that more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 354, recorded March 10th, 2016. It's a bird, it's a plane, it's Presentmon. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Drobo, a family of safe and expandable, yet simple to use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Visit drobo.com slash twit and use the code twit100 to save $100 off select Drobos, including the new B810i. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most delightful, most professional, and occasionally most rain-sodden hardware coverage in technology. We love the mobile, but mostly we love the desktops, preferably the high-performance ones, but we get cheap, too, because, quite frankly, that's the way I roll. Joining me, as always, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ryan Shrouts. Is Hello. it raining? Where you uh, are, it Mr. is. Shrouts? It is, yeah. It's been raining since about yesterday at this time, actually. Oh, my goodness. But uh, here's raining for you, too, out there. That's necessary for you guys. You need that. We don't necessarily need it. Um, but it does make me sleepy. It does make me like it's harder to get out of bed in the morning when it's raining. Uh, and I'm, I'm imagining uh, I will fall asleep fairly early this evening. Um, it turns out when you have a kid, that happens a lot, though. That it's I like, oh, it's, bring that up, but I figured it's 930. Probably... Weird. Snore. Because <laughs> <laughs> you've been up since the... Yeah, crack it's gone. just it's just a lot of work. It's a lot of extra effort involved in stuff. So <laughs> this whole child thing is just complicated. <laughs> oh my goodness. Some interesting news this week. We have a new what promises to be speed champion in the world of SSDs that we probably no, will not be able to afford uh, anytime in the near future. Yeah. Um, but you are continuing your battle with DirectX 12 performance testing. Uh Present Mon frame time performance data for DX12 slash UWP games. Yeah, so this is this is interesting. Uh, a lot of what we've talked about in the last few weeks uh, surrounding DirectX 12 benchmarking, and then last week or the week before, when it came to that unified Windows platform, and kind of a lot of the changes they were implementing with games and that that kind of are, are locked out of overlays, they're locked out of being able to change INI files and modding and stuff like that. One of the one of the concerns for us was performance evaluation, right? How are we going to do it? Uh, where are we going to be able to find tools that could do it? And it, it is a much more complex thing. Um, now, there has always existed this, this kind of, uh, uh, I don't want to say holy grail, but this, this massive knowledge, this massive information called the Windows Event Timer. Um, and it has basically information you can, any, any information you can ever possibly want about what's happening in Windows, from graphic side to storage side to uh, audio, video, whatever. Um, but it is also like the most unwieldy, complicated software, uh, accessing it, setting it up, trying to tell it what to look for and what to not look for and how to filter it all out was always uh, a huge pain. Um, and that's why we always had tools like Fraps. Uh, and then we had tools like uh, FCAT and frame rating that kind of did, uh, you know, stuff completely external from the system as well. In other words, just try to uh, try to get different data points than that. Um, the uh, there's a, a group of graphics guys, graphics engineers over at Intel, uh, and one of them that I talk with fairly often, off and on, uh, anytime new technologies comes out. He's a very smart guy, knows about DX12, knows about the graphics pipeline, knows all that kind of stuff. Um, and his team had some software that they would, had been writing internally for development profiling, right? So when a, when a game developer profiles software, their own software, they're trying to figure out how it performs, how it runs, where the bottlenecks right. are, those types of things. Um, and so when I was talking with him about the whole UWP DX12 fiasco, it came up that was like, you know, we kind of have some things that 
might be interesting for you. Let me see if I can get permission to release these in kind of an open source format. And he did. Uh, and they posted it yesterday. And it was called PresentMon. And it's basically a present monitor. The goal of this is to <laughs> look for present commands as they are given to the operating system. Um, and a present command is essentially the indication from uh, the game or the driver or the OS, actually in this case it's the OS, to say, hey, let's go ahead and send out the next frame or we're ready for the next frame uh, to, be, to begin processing. Uh, and so what you can do is if you judge the time between those present commands, you essentially have your frame times, right, mm -hmm. uh, to, to some degree. Uh, so what this tool does is it actually kind of takes all the Windows event timer stuff, the ETW uh, kind of suite, as it's called, and it filters it down to a really kind of like an easy-to-use, dummy-proof application that runs the command prompt that only looks for present commands. And you can filter based on application. You can look at all of them. Um, but the important part here is that this works regardless of the API because it's actually looking at the OS level, not the API level. So it works on DX11, works on DX12, works on Vulkan, works on OpenGL. Uh, it works on unified Windows platform games, right, which could huh. be DX12 or 11 or whatever. Um, so even though those games are locked down, the operating system event timings are still available. And so right. we still have access to that. So if you look at some of these graphs, like uh, the first one up at the top, it, the first two that are just like show green lines, uh, like that one right there, it's Gears of War Ultimate, uh, which is a UWP game. Uh, it has an integrated benchmark, but it's not very good. It doesn't give you detail. It doesn't log anything. This is showing you frame times from a GTX 980 Ti running, uh, looks like, you know, 60 seconds or so of uh, uh, of the game, right? And that's data we would have had, we we have not had access to before today or yesterday, however you want to look at it, right? Um, if you go down to the next graph, what's, what's important to note is that um, the, the, the present mon data is, very, very close, very similar in the pipeline to where Fraps would normally get its data. So this graph right here shows a DX11 game, right? It's not a DX12 game. We've been able to get data from this for a while. Um, but we wanted to profile this profiling app to see what data it was most correlated to. So the blue line in that graph that's very thin, very narrow, is our frame rating FCAT capture-based performance analysis. And it shows a very narrow band of frame times, which means it's very smooth, very consistent. The green line there shows PresentMon, which is a, you know, it's slightly wider. It's actually quite a bit wider, more variant. Um, and so that, that's that's kind of an interesting look. And the next graph uh, actually shows you how the PresentMon data compares to the FRAPS data. As you'll see, they're very, very similar in kind of their range and scope of variability, right? So um, it's not exact, so right. it is slightly different in the pipeline than where FRAPS is, but it's much closer um, to each other than they are to, you know, the output onto the screen. So if you look at the third graph down uh, right there, you'll see all three of those kind of combined. You get an idea that essentially what we're getting is FRAPS-style data from this new application rather than frame rating or, uh, you know, capture-based data. And it's, and it's important to point that out because I have spent so much time trying to tell people about the benefits of capture-based performance analysis. Um, right. And so this is not an analog to it. We're, we haven't, we haven't perfected it, but uh, we, we're getting more data than we were able to get to before. And then finally, if you scroll down, I think there's one more graph on there, and that actually shows like, hey, okay, we can actually get interesting information from this. That is the uh, 980 Ti versus the Fury X in Gears of War Ultimate Edition looking at frame times. And again, that's data we were not able to access or to utilize before yesterday. Um, and so even though it's still not perfect, this is a good first step towards being able to analyze and uh, profile games and benchmarks and actually other applications as well, um, anything that uses the present command. So the, what, what we've been able to solidify here is, hey, uh, it's not the end of the world now. We can actually, uh, games that are released as UWP apps will be able to profile to some degree. Uh, also, it's also kind of interesting to note that the UWP games are vSync limited in that 
they will only ever go up to your maximum refresh rate of your monitor. So uh, we were running at 120 hertz refresh rate on this system in order to give the highest range, or the, or the most range for the, the game to actually render at, right? So uh, when, we, when I ran this the first time on a 60 hertz monitor, you kind of had like a mostly straight line or a, a variable line that was very much centered on 16 milliseconds or 60 hertz refresh. So when we increase that up to a higher refresh rate monitor, we're able to get more uh, granular data out of it to really kind of compare uh, and mm -hmm. contrast the AMD and NVIDIA solutions here. So there's still some stuff to work out even on the UWP side, um, but thanks to this app that uh, actually the developers, kind of the graphics engineers at Intel said, look, we, here's a free tool we use internally anyway. Feel free to have a, uh, 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 a look at it. And this definitely uh, has helped us out so far. Excellent. Yeah. The uh, interesting news from AMD, um, XConnect technology for external graphics, uh, big, big amounts of excitement at uh, CES over Razer's Blade Stealth, uh, the external graphics box, uh, what we call the Razer Core. And it turns out the, some of the technology behind that is essentially AMD's XConnect, which has now been opened up to any manufacturer that wants to support it. Um, pretty crazy, right? So the the technology that AMD showed up for the announcement uh, is powered by Razer um, and Razer's core handles 375 watt GPUs, the R9 Fury, the Nano, the R9 300 series GPUs up to the R9 390X. Uh, the uh, Sebastian notes in the write-up that the R9 Fury X isn't listed as being compatible because there's no support for liquid cooling but I'm sure somebody's going to find a Dremel tool or a can opener and figure out a way to make that work because <laughs> gaming. Um, What's interesting about this is XConnect is not tied to any vendor. It's generic driver support for GPUs over Thunderbolt 3.0. Uh, all you need is, you know, Radeon software 16.2.2 or later, Thunderbolt 3 port, a 40 gigabit per second Thunderbolt 3 cable, Windows 10 build 10.586 or later, a certified Thunderbolt 3 graphics enclosure configured with support of Radeon R9 series GPUs, uh, Thunderbolt, uh, Thunderbolt firmware, uh, NVM v16. All of this is pretty manageable. The one thing that's going to be tricky is bio support for external graphics over Thunderbolt 3, which your laptop system vendor is going to have to make happen for you. And you could argue that someone might do an open source operating system update for that, but I doubt it because that would be a non-trivial modification uh, right. of the firmware. Uh, but uh, this is pretty cool. Um, Sebastian notes that this could be the beginnings of an open standard for external GPU support on laptops. Cue excitement and enthusiasm from all gamers that want to own a gaming laptop but don't want to own a 15-pound uh, beast. Uh, and you could argue that the Razer Blade Stealth already is that, point taken. Um, right. But uh, interesting, it, it, it's kind of, we've, we've, we've been seeing the toasters, the, the GPU toasters, uh, showing up for a while, and this is probably the closest it's come to being practical for all the vendors, at least the ones with the Thunderbolt 3 port to support. Excited? Y you ready for this? Or I am. Yeah. I have been for a very long time, honestly. Um, I, I, to, to me, I'm still trying to figure out exactly how much of this is AMD tech versus how much of it is like operating system based technology. Because right. uh, it was really, I, I, I'm sure the operating system had to build in, has to build in support for um, removal of graphics devices, especially while things may be utilizing them. Um, and then the drivers have to include support for that as well. But I'm not sure if like Microsoft mandated, here's how we're going to support external graphics configurations, or if it was maybe AMD kind of doing more of that uh, kind of de development side as well. Sure. Um, I mean, this is still... This is still what everybody wants. Like, I want to have my Dell XPS 13 um, to take with me when I go on a trip, but I also want to be able to game at home, uh, and I don't want to necessarily have to have another desktop PC there. If I could just have a little docking station that has my graphics card in it, and also, you know, a couple USB ports and stuff um, to connect external keyboards and mouse uh, to it, that's a plus as well. I mean, that, that's, that's really what we want. Um, and I'm excited to try to, I'll be at GDC next week. I'm sure AMD will be showing uh, this kind of configuration off. I'm curious to find out about the pricing and the availability uh, and uh, kind of what other options there are. Because there have been, there have been other external Thunderbolt-based graphics, uh, external graphics 
uh, enclosures, I guess. But I don't know if maybe they don't all meet some of these standards, you know, Thunderbolt firmware at a certain point, um, a certified Thunderbolt 3 graphics enclosure. Um, so I, I, I know Asus at CES showed one off as well. It was kind of a, a, a more universal looking one where obviously this Razer one may only work with their own laptops, but I would assume that wouldn't be the case, right? That the whole point of Thunderbolt 3 is it's kind of interoper interoperable uh, right. and as long as it's certified, it should just it should just work. So I'm also curious to see what NVIDIA's response is to this, if they have any kind of claims to make about their external GPU preparedness. There's some uh, mean and, part of me that says it'll be incredibly similar but non-compatible and require vendors to make a choice. Yeah, I, I mean, you can see that you can see that direction going down there. Um, I mean, it wouldn't be the first path. time. No, no. But again, if it's like, if the idea of a certified enclosure is a thing, then you would think you would just have to have graphic drivers, graphics drivers that install it. Now, you know, if you're Nvidia or AMD for that point, you want Dell and HP and those guys to sell external enclosures for GPUs, and you just want to make sure your GPU is the one that people want to put in there. Um, right. So I, I think, uh, especially at this point, after this kind of X Connect release where they talk about it being open and that it's not vendor specific, it would be a, f a pretty big disservice uh, for NVIDIA to come out and kind of counter that with something that was very uh, locked down, I guess. It would be nice of them to play on behalf of the entire community. It would. Uh, yes. I don't know. Yes. We can hope. Of course, your Carbide 400C Mid Tower Enclosure Review. Ladies and gentlemen, mid-tower enclosure, very large window, black. Very. Yeah, it's actually, I mean, as far as cases with windows goes, it is a very understated window. I love the fact that it's practically the full entire side of the case. Um, it is subtle. Uh, Sebastian, who wrote the review up at PC Pro, refers to it as understated. Um, does not offer the noise dampening of the Q, um, but that is okay. Um, two three and a half inch drive bays, three two point five inch drive bays, seven expansion slots, mini ITX, micro ATX, ATX, EATX. Should you be one of the you know eight people who bought an EATX motherboard in the last few months? Uh, two USB three point ports, microphone, headphone, um, fan mounts, three hundred and twenty or two one forty at top uh, or at the front, uh, two one twenty or one forty at the top, one one twenty millimeter. Fan in the rear it includes a single 120 uh, at the rear and a 140 millimeter fan at the front. Um, 360 millimeter radiator will fill at the front. 240 millimeter radiator at the top. 120 millimeter or a small radiator at the rear. Um, you know, standard ATX power supply. Uh, 370, basically a eight and a half inch, 370 millimeters uh, GPU maximum. Um, yep. The uh, uh, $99. Nice looking case. Um, nice looking case and looks like it was fairly easy to build inside of if I'm not mistaken so yeah I I actually, I'm a big fan of the way this case looks uh, we actually got in its bigger brother the 600C that was out uh, a little while ago um, oh, in for one of our correction? VR builds yeah 14.5 inch GPUs not 8 inch 14, 370 millimeter is a 14 oh right 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 yes yeah my apologies no, yeah yeah, ten and a half is like in. reference speed. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the big brother is is very similar, except it's mm -hmm. uh, it actually rotates the system. Is it 180 degrees? I think it might be 100. It's 180 degrees. It rotates it uh, inside the inside the system. Um, wait, no, 90. I, now I can't see the case from here, so I'm not sure. Uh, but the 400C is a typical kind of. Uh, uh, mounting system for it in there, and it really is very, very similar looking. It's just, it's just a little bit smaller. I do like that 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 window. I think last night on our podcast, I called it the Infinity Window because it reminds me of like the branding that they would use on uh, the Dell XPS 13 <laughs> Infinity Display, Infinity Edge Display. Um, uh, very nice. The build quality on it is pretty good, according to Sebastian. Uh, the doors kind of come off real easily as well, which is a nice touch for when you've got it on the side and you're working on it. You don't have to worry about the doors getting in the way. Um, you know, and, and for 100 bucks, I think it's a $99 case. The build, qual build quality and build of materials is actually is actually pretty, pretty good. Um, Corsair has, you know, they've they've pretty much run the gamut of case designs at this point, right? Like, I feel like if you go from 
the 900D down to like the Bulldog home theater PC system that they, you know, they've been showing for a while, but will actually be launching this year. Um, they will basically have one of everything. There's no way you could possibly have a case requirement that they wouldn't, <laughs> that they wouldn't have a solution for. Um, but there's a lot of neat stuff about this case that help it stand out for 99 bucks um, for, for people looking for new builds. New builds. Yeah. New builds are good. Oh my goodness! The uh, the uh, uh, other thing that came out from uh, AMD this week is the Radeon Crimson Edition sixteen point three. Have you had a chance to test these yet? Um, yes, kind of. Uh, they're actually, if you look at that article that looks at uh, the PresentMon performance tool. <clears throat> We're using the 16.3 driver in it, right? And it adds uh, uh, improvements for uh, Gears of War specifically and DirectX 12 in general into it. But this driver actually, you know, it, this is the one that introduced the X-Connect. It introduces uh, uh, drastic improvements in performance in um, both uh, uh, Gears of War Ultimate Edition and the new Hitman game that's coming out tomorrow, uh, which is supposed to still launch with the DirectX 12 variant. Uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, they have another feature in here that they're calling, <clears throat> uh, it's like a power efficiency check mark. I can't, here it is. Um, it quote, allows the user to disable some power efficiency optimizations, which uh, uh, I, what I, I haven't tested this yet, but what I'm thinking is that this is for uh, cards like the Nano or cards like, um, the Fury X that that maybe or maybe just the regular Fury that kind of like they're trying to keep at a specific thermal dissipation level uh, mm -hmm. in order to do that. So they adjust their clock speeds dynamically, which is which is good. You know, NVIDIA is doing that. AMD is doing that. But on cards like the Nano that had very aggressive power limits, uh, they would vary the clock speed pretty dramatically. And because of that very rapid clock speed change, you would see frame rate or frame time changes, so you'd see some stutter and some judder ins uh, inserted because of the less than consistent uh, GPU clock speed. So what I'm guessing this setting is, is it will disable that, allow it to run a slightly higher than what it was rated at, you know, when it launched or out of the box, but at the with the goal of having a more consistent clock speed so that you don't have to worry about introducing uh, judder or frame time variance because of that, because of that, specific feature so um hopefully it's something we'll, i'll get a chance to mess around with or somebody else will get a chance to mess around with soon and we'll be able to report back results on it um but uh that that's 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 pretty interesting so they they did a lot in this driver uh and from what i'm being told like just direct x12 in general has kind of been re-architected uh, quite a bit in in 16.3 and so as now that we start we're going to start to see you know ashes of the singularity officially launches on march 31st um hitman the new hitman game comes out starts coming out tomorrow uh and we'll see direct x12 titles kind of at a regular cadence throughout the rest of 2016 so and it's also important for them just to get in the habit of releasing drivers right nvidia is very good at that they're very mm -hmm. frequent um, with their driver releases and um, AMD is not so much. So uh, I think just kind of getting in the habit of doing something over and over again is really going to help them. Oh, this also <laughs> adds direct direct flip. So the, the issue we talked about with the Ashes of the Singularity benchmark where uh, we couldn't get it to do like true V-Sync off uh, oh. with, with screen tearing will now be addressed. You'll be able to do that in the, uh, in the AMD uh, platforms as well. So that's nice. all part of 16.3. Good on them. Yes, I agree. You should be backing up your data if you're not backing up your data. Three, two, one, it's a simple idea. Three copies, right? You got the one in your computer. You got a separate one on another machine. You got one at a different location. Three copies on at least two different mediums or two different formats, at least one off-site. Great way to do one of those backups locally is a Drobo, ladies and gentlemen. It's really simple. Um, Drobo is the safe, simple, expandable solution for your storage needs. They have a family, a veritable cornucopia of external storage arrays. You can pretty much run a Drobo. It's just about that easy. 
And uh, Drobo's added to the high end of its product line with the Drobo B810i. It's an 8-bay iSCSI SAM with data-aware tiering that offers storage capabilities usually found in more expensive enterprise solutions. Now, you very rarely hear me say the phrase enterprise solutions, but the idea is that they are bringing big, ready-to-go, bolted-together, high-speed stuff that's really easy to administer. Data where tiering means it's automatically uh, capable of tiering frequently used transactional data from stored data that's seldom used. That means businesses can consolidate storage resources and share that storage across all their connected clients and their applications. You can access physical and virtual storage in a single array with on-demand ability to scale for both capacity and performance as needed, i.e. it'll adapt to what you need at a given moment. Smart volumes allow you to create up to 255 individual drives with a maximum capacity of 64 terabytes each. It's a lot of storage, people, provisioning as necessary. No more guessing how to make each volume because, you know, you don't have to worry about how big it's going to be because it's going to be up to 64 terabytes. That is a ton of space. Dual iSCSI sports are up to 2x gigabit Ethernet performance when you use MPIO in a Microsoft environment. Collaboration, testing, development, backup, running Microsoft Exchange. So much more can be done inside of your Drobo. It is perfect for small and medium-sized businesses that don't have dedicated IT support because it's really simple to run i've been using drobos on and off since drobo began a long time ago and uh it's really simple did i mention the whole idea you can see it there in your monitor right now see the lights kids they're green that means everything is okay if a drive you know, if, if a drive light turns yellow that means it is time to stop drop and basically look at the administration tool and get ready to pop in a new drive you're running out of space uh, our drive dies it goes red it's super, 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 super easy to use. I do not know how to make it sound even simpler. Like, you know, if it goes yellow, put a bigger drive in. If it goes red, you need, you know, to replace that drive <sighs> immediately. I mean, I, I, yep. I don't know how to make it any less complicated than that. Uh, I've been running a Drobo 5D here for my storage on my machine. It is nice. It is speedy. And it offers me a fairly huge amount of storage. Uh, and I have storage image. Uh, like I, storage issues, I think, is probably a safe way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like me a lot of storage. You know, uh, the 5D is pretty cool. You know, USB 3.0 um, and five drives. And I'm happy. I'm happy with the performance because it's moving really, really fast. It also offers a pair of Thunderbolt ports. If you want a daisy chain Thunderbolt devices, with Mac OS 10. So it's good stuff. Cool. If you haven't checked it out, do us a favor. Uh, visit drobo.com slash twit to learn more about the Drobo B810i and to check out their complete line of products. And when you order a B810i between now and April 30th, you get two free two terabyte hard drives for free. Did I mention free? Two free two terabyte hard drives. Plus when you use the code twit100, you'll save $100 off the purchase of a B810i or other select Drobo models. That's drobo.com slash twit. Use the code twit100 and we want to thank Drobo for their continuing support of this week in computer hardware. Indeed. Vulcan is here. NVIDIA releases the 36447 Wickle drivers with Vulcan. 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 Sorry, it I've sounds been watching, cool, doesn't it? I've, yeah, I've been watching like the new Marvels trailers, uh, the Marvel trailers, the battle trailers, and uh, you know, I'm feeling very breathy and excited about anything that sounds even remotely sci-fi right now. <laughs> right, I agree. Uh, yeah, so it sounds cool. Yeah. The, I mean, so this driver um, added Vulcan support. It is worth noting um, that 36447 has already been superseded. Uh, 36447 had apparently a pretty nasty uh, bug in it um, where if you like had multiple... 36451 now. Right. That's the one you should download and install. And I'm okay. pretty sure they took 36447 down because okay. uh, what would happen was users that had multiple monitors, if you had multiple monitors connected to your system when you did the install, when you rebooted, all you got was a black screen. And disconnecting the monitors didn't solve that. You had to actually reboot into safe mode and reinstall the driver or uninstall that driver um, mm -hmm. to get it back up and running. Um, leading some people to believe that, that NVIDIA had killed their hardware, when in reality they just, it was a software issue, you had to go into safe mode and, and undo it, which was still, just which was still crappy. disabled it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and like the workaround was, like I said, go into safe mode and uninstall it, uh, go back to an older version, or uh, 
disconnect your other monitor since you only have one monitor attached, install the new driver, and then reattach your other monitors, which is also a crummy user experience. Uh, but that has apparently been fixed with the 364.51. They fixed that bug. Um, so you can just apparently go ahead and install all you want nice. with, uh, uh, with all of your monitors attached. Uh, but it did add Vulcan support. It also is the, quote, game-ready driver for uh, Tom Clancy's The Division, Need for Speed, Hitman, and Ashes of the Singularity. So, nice. you know, that just means that there's some uh, performance improvements for all of those games in there. Um, and that's it. I think that's all that's, yeah. that's, that's stood out in that particular yeah. driver. You missed the the episode where we talked about Vulcan. That's the Kronos group, which probably is even less clear as to what it is. It's a new set of APIs, uh, AMD Imagination, Intel, NVIDIA, Qualcomm, uh, and lots and lots of other individuals, uh, corporations working together to attempt to make OpenGL ready to fight DirectX 12, or at least to make uh, everything from cell phones to desktop GPUs, or cell phone GPUs to desktop GPUs, more super awesome to code to uh, and out of the the iron fist of Microsoft. Am I overstating right. that iron fist of Microsoft thing? It just no. seems like it's pretty much what they're trying to do. No. Something no, that's, that's uh, pretty excited, uh, pretty exciting for me uh, and my super micro mini ATX, unbelievably tiny S4 mini case, uh, which is currently running a 750 Ti, is uh, Asus's new GeForce GTX 950. Uh, two gigabytes of RAM requires no PCI e power. Um, which is fascinating. Um, you know, uh, the NVIDIA announced a GTX 950 uh, TDP of 90 watts, um, which means it needed a PCIe power connector, um, which yep. makes it, you know, it's a big jump over the 750, uh, uh, 750 Ti or 750, you should say. Well, 750 Ti or 750 in terms of performance. And as Ryan notes, uh, or Sebastian notes in the write up, um, it seems to be the replacement for the 750. Um, but they've gotten the power consumption uh, down to like 75 watts max. So you can run it much like the 750 Ti without an external uh, GPU power. So, Which is cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah it was available temporarily, not currently available. Um, oh, really? That's what the note at the bottom says. Well, let me let me go. Okay. We can do a, we're We're on the internet. We are live. <laughs> Most of the I time. I have the power of Amazon. Well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the rain has not stopped us yet, but uh, the rain has not killed course. the internet connection. I uh, say that you should see the amount of rain that's actually falling down right now over here. Uh, I would not say that lightly. Up uh, 750 Ti, it's it is definitely not currently available on Nvidia. So keep an eye out though. That's uh, the A4, Asus GeForce GTX 950 2G. Uh, do not confuse it with an older model that is incredibly similar but will require the full 90 watts and a PCIe adapter. Um, no pricing information on that as of yet. Yeah. But it's a very nice looking card. It's got a certain sort of R2-D2 kind of color pattern going on there that I'm down with. <laughs> Agreed. It's, yeah, I like that it's got HDMI 2.0 uh, uh, DisplayPort and DVI, so they didn't cheap out on the ports. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, man. Uh, Alan and I were chatting about this yesterday. I'm sure you got to chat a lot more with him. Um, Seagate's going to show off uh, at OCP Summit what I'm now thinking of is the ridiculous SSD. 10 gigabytes per second PCI Express X16 flash drive. Claims to reach uh, uh, half, height, uh, half height device over PCIe 3.0 X8 link hitting 6.7 gigabytes per second. Uh, that's the first one. And the second one is the crazy one. It's the 3.0 by 16 unit. If you scroll down a little bit, um, basically a, a GPU worth of lanes that claims 10 gigabytes per second. And if you close in on that picture, you will see a massive heat sink over a lot of uh, memory. <laughs> like an M.2 uh, form factor SSD inside of there. Uh, excuse me, four M.2 form factor SSDs inside of there, which would be like four separate NVMe devices. Um, so, uh, and, and Ryan, I should say, uh, Alan points in his article uh, that 10 gigabytes per second number probably seems familiar if you remember him uh, last summer bolting together five Intel SSD 750s, uh, dropping 2 million IOPS and 10 gigabytes per second uh, in a pretty 
crazy build. So, and I think if you unit. look at that, did oh, you mention? I mean, did you mention like if you look at that diagram of that second mm -hmm. card, it looks suspiciously like four M.2 yeah. ports in there. That. I mean, it's like eh. in parallel. <laughs> <laughs> Could be multiple SSD controllers. Could be a fancy new controller we haven't seen yet. Uh, yeah. Needs the Open Compute Project specifications. Uh, they say it's production ready. And uh, we will find out more about that later this year. I'm excited. I'm curious. Yeah. I, I can't imagine, uh, you know, it's going to be at the Open Compute Project Summit 2016 in San Jose, uh, which is actually going on right now. Um, and uh, no pricing is expected any time in the near future. <laughs> and if it is, it's not expected to be uh, anything remotely affordable by normal humans. So. No, no. Despite our ribbing before the show, this will not be a ten cents per gigabyte product. No. Unfortunately, I'm as just I'm just as disappointed as everybody else. Oh man, uh, Corsair's got a couple of new power supplies. Uh, the SF450 and the SF600 SFX. Are these? Uh, they're 80 plus gold certification. Are these expensive PSUs or are these affordable PSUs? Um, they're fairly affordable. Uh, the lower wattage one is going to be the 450 watt is 89 bucks. The 600 watt is 119. Th that's fairly expensive for the wattage that you're getting, right. um, but you're paying for the, the the compressed form factor. So these are SFX power supplies. It's Corsair's first. SFX power supplies. It was actually a standard that Silverstone created uh, when they were trying to build their own kind of custom form factor machines and small form factor machines where they wanted a smaller um, uh, depth power supply uh, in there. And so they built the SFX uh, kind of specifications for that. And we have seen uh, a couple of other, I can't remember who they are now, but there's at least one other vendor besides Silverstone that has released an SFX unit. But Corsair now comes into the ring. Um, <clears throat> and interestingly enough, it's probably, it may be because uh, that Bulldog case that I mentioned earlier may actually use SFX. And so they wanted to have one of their own power supplies to sell along with it. Uh, so that, that would make sense as well. But either way, getting more vendors into the ring uh, of selling this particular standard will just help lower prices across the board to give you different options, give you different wattages. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I don't think 600 is the highest wattage we've seen. I think we saw a 700 watt SFX unit recently, but 600 is pretty up there. Like you could run multi GPU, you know, maybe not 980 Ti or Fury, but, you know, 980 or 390X multi GPU as, as well as, uh, you know, a higher end Core i7 processor and still get all of that inside the, as small of a chassis as you physically can fit it in uh, without having the power supply be kind of your limiting, your limiting factor. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, you know, it's it's good to see them 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 again broach out into something else slightly different. They're fully modular power supplies, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, and um, yeah, they yeah, should be good no, to go. No crazy piles of cables to hide inside the secret right. panel of your system, which is a big plus. Yeah, especially considering it's an SFX unit that uh, uh, is going to be into a small form factor chassis, more than likely. <laughs> You know, being able to disconnect cables you're not going to use and store them away uh, right. will help make for a cleaner build, definitely. Cleaner builds are good. Um, yeah. March 21st, ladies and gentlemen, Apple is going to have its latest special event. Uh, expected to release a smaller iPhone, a new iPad, and additional Apple Watch bands. Possibly the mythical uh, Apple battery watch band. Uh, I know many Apple Watch owners are torn between the desire to see an Apple Watch that does more things uh, without the phone versus not wanting to replace their incredibly overpriced timepiece. Uh, I'm cranky <laughs> when I say that. Um, you know, the more I spend with my, the more time I spend with my Apple Watch, the more time I love Windows. The more I love Windows 10. Um, feeling cranky about that. It's going to be streamed uh, live on Apple.com. I'm sure there's going to be coverage on Twits. Um, and uh, it's funny, uh, to live stream it, you need like a, a Macworld says you need a Mac with OS 10, 10 10.8.5, and Safari 6.0.5 or later, a PC with Microsoft's Edge browser for Windows 10, or an iPhone, iPad, or iPod Touch running iOS 7 or later, uh, or a second-gen Apple TV or up if you want to watch that live. So basically, iPhone SE, uh, Macworld speculating, and a lot of other places, a 4-inch iPhone, which is I'm really pretty tempting. sure... I thought you could play this back on like uh, uh, the VLC player if you just fed up the RTMP or something or the HLS I just, link. 
I just think it's but, so 1999 to be listing the browser and platform to watch a, a streaming video. That's, Agreed. That's, I, I can't imagine that there's people out there like, well, I got to watch this Apple Live event. I guess I don't have a <laughs> MacBook. I need to go buy one immediately so that I can watch it. Um, yeah. yeah. But that's 10 a.m. Monday, March 21st. Uh, 9 to 5 Mac has uh, uh, pictures of the potential new uh, uh, Apple Watch bands that showed up temporarily really? on a check store okay. site. Yeah. Um, nice. Yeah, I thought that was pretty amusing. Uh, and uh, also amusing to me uh, as a, a longtime Nest thermometer user uh, who was had to turn off all of the fancy uh, I will cool the house down because your family isn't there features, uh, which would turn off with the family in the room with the Nest, which I thought was a, a bug. Yeah, same thing sure. happened to me. Um, <laughs> Nest's uh, iOS and Android apps uh, will allow to start monitoring your phone's location. Now, the Internet of Things... In lots of areas, whether you're talking about car devices or home devices, you're using geofencing. Geofencing uh, sometimes works well, often doesn't. Uh, but I think the new Home slash Away Assist uh, is a wonderful addition to the Nest thermostats. And part of a, a what I hope to uh, I, I, I hope to like you know I, this is obviously Google uh, on the Apple side of things. I hope they come up with some like a, an actual standalone HomeKit app. Um, but that's what's uh, I'm curious. I'm curious to see how well it runs and uh, and uh, what uh, what uh, is going on uh, with the Internet of Things and it's sucking less. Um, Agreed. Quote in the uh, Verge article: um, Greg Q, senior product manager at Nest, uh, says basically by observing the patterns, they're going to figure out uh, when people are actually home, which is good because the thermometer itself doesn't actually often know when people are in the same room. Quote, this is an input that's going to make it more accurate and efficient. Uh, though Nest needs to see your location, the company says it won't track where you go. All information it cl collects will be encrypted. Uh, mm. So it might not mm. track where you go, but I'm curious to see if they bundle that data and offer the services uh, through third-party sales or something like that. So this is not particularly... Uh, this is nobody's going. Wow, why didn't I think of that? Because lots of other things have done it. Uh, but I think it's. I like to see expensive devices get made better through obvious solutions. Ooh, I said solution. I never say that word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Moving I on up. Yeah, I'm just. I'm just saying. Hey, if you. Uh, if you are curious to find out more about what's going on with Ryan Shroud, I suggest you head on over to pcper.com. And uh, you guys are still running your Patreon campaign. You guys are building bigger, exciting things at PC Per. Is it patreon.com slash PC Per? That is PC correct. Per? That's the one. Part of the evolution to the future, the ad-free future of PC Per. It's exactly. A it's, a, it's, a, it's a longer evolution than initially expected, but it is, <laughs> it is there. It is there. It is there. You can find me at techthing.com or AVXL, which is the home theater and uh, home entertainment gear and content. Uh, podcasted with uh, Robert Heron. You can find that at avxl.com or search for it on iTunes. That is an actual audio podcast. We're not doing video at all, which is exciting. Um, <laughs> so, no video editing. Not yet. Not unless our Patreon gets bigger and that's uh, avxl. Uh, excuse me, patreon.com slash avxl. Um, man, I got some interesting computer speakers to talk about next week and I am playing around um, with uh, an actual built by a real company uh, desktop PC that claims to be ready for VR. And you and I can talk about that after it arrives. That should be highly interesting. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not a really tough build. It's just, it's just a, a fairly, you know, healthy check to write if you want somebody else to build it. <laughs> yes. That, yes. Uh, agreed. I guess depending on how out of control it is when you get in. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to This Week in Computer Hardware. You can find all of our podcasts at twit.com slash twitch. Information on how to subscribe and get it in your favorite podcaster. And, uh, of course, you can also tweet at Ryan Shroud or at Patrick Horton on Twitter. You can find us on Facebook if you look hard enough to. We want to thank each and every one of you for listening. With that, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Shroud. We'll see you next week on Twitch.